kind introduction and the the, the advertisement <laughs> um, and also for the opportunity to speak today and to everyone for their interest uh, in, in the talk. Um, yes, uh, I'm based in Tokyo, so it's 8, 8 p.m. here. I hope this um, the time difference was uh, like the, the current time slot is not too inconvenient for, for all of you. And thank you for taking the time out of your, your working day um, to join today. Um, if it's okay with everyone, since I'm based at the other end of the world from most of you, and I'm a little bit worried about the connection. Um, so I, I will turn off my video until the Q and A. Um, so that there won't be any like audio distortions or something. I want to like prioritize the content over this. Um, so yeah, see you at, at in the Q and A section. Um, yeah, so I, I will talk about the management of passenger behavior on urban public transport today, and specifically, I'll look at the government of mobilities. Um, through the example of media initiatives by urban public transport providers in Tokyo. And I will focus on the visuality or the visual aspects of these campaigns. Um, before we start, a few things of not housekeeping, but just general comments. So first, regarding the structure of um, today's talk. So I'll first talk a little bit about the theoretical inspiration for today's talk so that um, um, is regarding the government of mobilities and also the idea of regimes of mobility, um, which you've seen in, in the title of today's talk. Um, I'll then talk about the need for the management of urban mobilities, um, speaking specifically about the challenges that are posed by the character of public transport environments. And um, we'll then introduce my case study. So like transit etiquette poster campaigns issued by Japanese public transport providers, which um, um, since they're graphically inscribing behavioral expectations into public transport spaces, um, can be framed as a potential visual mobility regime. And I will then look at the meaning structures that guide uh, these efforts based on research that I conducted with the people involved in them. And finally, we'll reflect uh, on like the visual and the governmental aspects of these uh, initiatives. Now, um, today's talk is actually based on uh, some publications that are already out, um, but I'm re-examining um, my arguments and my findings from them in the context uh, of the notion of regimes of mobility that I know um, some Anthropod members have worked on. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Jamie Coates, um, senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, um, whom I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, uh, for, for suggesting this approach for today's talk. Um, before we jump in, one final short disclaimer. Um, by the nature of the topic of, of the presentation, I'll, I'll probably throw around terms like misconduct, misbehavior, and uh, misbehaving, deviance, and so on. And I hope it goes without saying that I'm not really interested in putting forward like any kind of normative ideas of what constitutes so-called co correct conduct in public transport. And I'm rather using these terms to refer to behaviors that are perceived as problematic by either public transport providers and or public transport users being fully aware that what is ultimately considered uh, misconduct is, is something that's subjective. Now with these comments out of the way, uh, let us jump into the presentation proper. And for this, I'll start by, start by talking about the relationship between mobilities and their regulation. So human movement, um, is something that often becomes a subject of efforts to shape, guide, and control it due to mobility's potential to be disruptive and challenge existing orders or become otherwise problematic. So that means that the management of mobilities is really like a core challenge for contemporary and increasingly mobile societies. In the words of um, Salazar and Smart, 
control over people's mobility potential and movement has become a central concern for projects of management and governance. So in response to this, this challenge or this need, uh, authorities engage in various regulatory and administrative interventions in movement which have been described as regimes of mobility. So um, that means endeavors uh, to constrain, manage and scrutinize flows of movement um, and thus affecting uh, individual mobility practices and potentials. And I want to like take a moment here to speak about two examples of such endeavors. Um, the first one relates to efforts to, to regulate flows, transnational flows of people, especially migrants. And actually most research um, in this way of um, the mobility regime is, is on this. Um, so for example, Wang has uh, positioned artifacts such as passports and visas as a regime of mobility that is designed by the state to control the movement of people. Similarly, Shamir has used the term to highlight processes of closure, entrapment and containment, as well as the prevention of movement and the blocking of access, identifying borders, fences, ghettos and gated communities as examples of, exam of elementary forms of physical features of the mobility regime. And because of this focus on closure and containment, Turner has argued that um, perhaps like the term immobility regime would be more appropriate um, for, for what Shamir is describing. Um, in addition to this, we can also see, for example, or uh, like identify um, a mobility regime in terms of the management of automobilities. Um, so that means the various um, kind of like complex legal, semiotic, material and moral systems that have been put into place to govern and limit the practices of drivers. And there's a whole body of like really excellent research on this, even though as far as, it, I'm, as, far as I'm aware, it does not explicitly fra frame it in, in terms of like a mobility regime, um, but it's um, still highly of interest and highly relevant here. What I want to do today is to highlight that it's also important to, in, in addition to transnational migration and automobility, um, to look at the regulation of um, mobility practices in the context of public transport. So for example, in terms of interventions in passenger conduct. So what I plan to do is examine a potential urban mobility regime. And this is really something that I consider a crucial task considering the number of people that use public transport on a daily basis. Um, and it is the focus of today's talk. And I'll, I'll do this now first by continuing, um, um, first continuing by introducing some characteristics of our public transport that can um, inject friction into mobility practices and experiences and thus give rise to a perceived need for the management and governance of these spaces and practices. So public transport environments are spaces of forced proximity with sharing ve uh, vehicle and station space as uh, with others as kind of like defining characteristics of what makes for public transport usage. Train stations and subway uh, carriages have been described as quintessentially urban spaces in which passengers move with others. And it is because of this forced proximity to other public transport users that there is an inherent potential of discomfort to urban mobility and to the usage of public transport. As the physical proximity to other passengers is in fact actually one of the reasons why many people state that they dislike taking public transport. And this kind of adversity uh, is evident, for example, from passengers' preferences to stand rather than to sit down next to other commuters, to strangers, and the exercise of social avoidance and civil inattention on public transport. Another consequence of this inevitability of co-presence and proximity is that conduct in public transport environments can be seen as a public performance that is, that is shaped by behavioral expectations and social cultural norms. This can have a certain constraining effect as commuter behavior 
um, can be seen as taking on a rule governed and scripted character with constraints potentially working to limit friction which might otherwise arise in public transport environments as a consequence of this forced uh, proximity. This obs the observance of these habits and competencies um, then constitutes a certain form of mobility capital. So a resource which can influence the speed and the comfort of journeys in public transport and facilitate the smooth operation of the public transport system itself. On the other hand, the transgression of these codes of commuter conduct constitutes what uh, I will now refer to the talk um, to as, as passenger misbehavior and, and misconduct. So behaviors that are perceived as inconsiderate, impolite or otherwise uh, inappropriate. So for example, passengers cutting in line, occupying multiple seats, littering and so on. So various behaviors that, that can become problematic really for like a range of diverse reasons. And just like the observance of the codes of passenger conduct um, can facilitate the smooth operation of, um, of the public transport system, their infraction also can lead to, um, to for example, accident and, or accidents or delays. Um, for example, when passengers block carriage doors or attempt to board at the last minute, thus forcing train drivers to increase the dwell time at the station. Passenger behavior can also disturb the embodied and effective transit experiences of fellow commuters. So for example, um, in, when passengers block empty seats in a crowded train with their belongings, which can become a source of irritation, or through behaviors that give rise to unwanted stimuli in the vehicle, which can provoke annoyance and discomfort. So for example, with people like listen to loud music or eat smelly food. Consequently, um, misconduct by fellow passengers can aggravate potential discomfort at uh, discontent passengers feel towards the public nature of public transport by adding further sources of discomfort and annoyance. Um, and that there is, in fact, research that has shown that public transport users feel that even mundane instabilities and disorders negatively affect um, the experience of public transport journeys. Um, accordingly, Perceived passenger misbehavior can, can lower the appeal of public transport and as, thus re reduce people's willingness to use it for their everyday mobility needs. And that means that, that passenger misconduct poses a problem. By problem, I don't mean a threat to a certain like imagined moral order of public transport spaces, but rather a practical business challenge due to its impact on efficiency, safety, amenity, and profitability of public transport operations. Because of these potential negative consequences, it's no surprise that public transport providers engage with passenger misconduct in various ways and seek to regulate our mobility practices. So in terms of severe and criminal offenses, they might, for example, turn to CCTV and patrols, Whereas in terms of more mundane offenses, such as behaviors that are simply inconsiderate or rude, um, these are often addressed through communication initiatives that encourage desirable passenger behavior, um, such as through posters, signage, and announcements. So these are initi initiatives like, like the ones that you see on the, on the slide here, um, which have been observed on transport systems around the world and which you might have seen in your own city or, or while traveling. And this is the kind of media initiative that I studied um, in my last project. Those so so-called MANA poster campaigns by Japanese urban railway providers. Um, so these are elaborately designed posters that encouraged um, desirable passenger conduct, posters that look often like this, for example and that address a diverse array of passenger behaviors that range from basic mobility skills, such as boarding etiquette, to really specific minute behaviors, such as the correct way to hold a smartphone on a crowded train. And these kind of posters uh, form a ubiquitous presence on Tokyo's urban railway system and have been around for many decades. Even conservative accounts kind of trace their origin to like um, 
1974, but it's, uh, it's likely that the history is much longer. Now I studied these posters through a year of fieldwork in Tokyo. Uh, and this fieldwork was driven by general curiosity about these posters. So I wanted to find out like how and why they are produced, why do they look the way they do, why do they target the behaviors they target and so on. And I, I thought to address these questions through a combination of different research methods. Um, for example, uh, interviews with uh, sit down interviews with people involved in, in making these posters. So I spoke to a total of 34 transport advertising and design professionals with interviews lasting around like one hour to one and a half hours. Uh, I conducted document analysis of uh, industry documents such as industry journals, press releases and so on. And uh, I also conducted a visual analysis of posters on top of that. Of course, also used participative research methods um, such as collaborative, uh, such as like a collaborative creative project with a MANA poster artist. Um, I hosted a participative research event with Japanese train fans. I did fieldwork as a passenger and I joined public industry events, as you can see on this uh, great photo on the, the bottom right here, which shows me with two mascots of the Tokyo subway system. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so what did I find through this research and, and what does it tell us about posters as the potential visual mobility regime? Now, these kind of transit etiquette posters are obviously kind of like didactic intervention in passenger conduct as they inscribe behavioral expectations and rules into public transport environments. And they're also inherently visual in the nature. They are, I mean, posters are a visual media. Um, they, they wield their visuality as a tool, so to speak. So for example, by turning to innovative design um, to, um, to attract the attention of passengers, something that we'll look at in a bit more detail later. And they also use visuality as a sanction. Um, and this means that they, they communicate and warn that misconduct will make you the target of the gaze of the passenger collective. So for example, that is something that you see on these posters here, um, where um, the, the potential offender um, is, is faced with a disciplinary gaze of other public transport users that is very prominent on these posters. So, so what these posters eventually uh, kind of do is remind you of the visibility of your own misconduct. Um, this kind of strategy of em 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 emphasizing the, ga the gaze of others is actually a common strategy on other urban signage too. So for example, it's something that's common on um, crime prevention signage, um, as these two examples from the UK and Japan uh, exemplify and this yeah this the strategy of like visualizing the gaze is it's kind of it's based on the psychological assumption that people are more likely to behave in line with norms if they know that they're being watched so posters these posters just remind us of a, of a strategy of social control so a mechanism that's deployed to facilitate adherence to societal norms which in this case are imposed on mobility practices. Specifically, they appear to resemble what sociologist Ellen Hunt uh, has described as moral regulation. So politics in which some agents act to problematize the conduct, values or culture of others and seek to act upon them through moralizing discourses, practices and regulation. And this kind of, um, these kind of like interpretations of transit etiquette posters as regulatory instruments are also very much in line with the tenor of uh, a prior scholarly commentary on efforts to shape conduct of public transport users, which has to describe similar media um, initiatives in public transport spaces as disciplinary devices. Now, this interpretation makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, however, it is a bit at odds with the emic understanding um, of many of my participants who told a much more complex story. So the transport and design officials that I spoke to 
actually explicitly positioned manner poses as a customer service effort rather than a means of policing passenger misconduct. And they emphasized that, um, that customer concerns and sensibilities are the principal considerations that guide uh, posters design and deployment. And this is, for example, evident from one of the quotes from my, my interviews. Um, so here from an interview with the railway company customer service officer who said that we want passengers to feel comfortable and at ease when using our services. We do what we can to achieve this by improving facilities and training staff and so on. However, the thing about trains is that our customers are really diverse. Inconsiderable behavior by just one customer can make safety and comfort unachievable. It is only if we gain the cooperation of all customers that we can truly improve our services. Manner improvement and service improvement really are proportionate to each other. Now, it's tempting to dismiss this kind of alternative framing as kind of like a form of corporate whitewashing, but there is actually good evidence that support this admittedly counterintuitive interpretation. And I want to introduce three pieces of evidence um, that kind of like back up this interpretation. The first of these is that the transgressions that are taken up by Japanese transit etiquette posters are intimately tied to commuter concerns. The contents of posters is informed by complaints regarding poor behavior of other passengers that transport users submit to railway companies, as well as the results of industry surveys and customer satisfaction surveys. So for example, the poster on the right here advertises the results of the annual uh, survey regarding the most annoying passenger behaviors that conducted by the um, Japanese Private Railway Association. Um, so this kind of like sourcing uh, of poster content makes for an almost bottom up um, kind of like, yeah, so sourcing of, of like the, the targeted behaviors as the codes of transit etiquette that are set out by poster initiatives are closely connected to public transport users' opinions um, and yeah, more closely connected to them than normative ideas of good passenger conduct that are held by transit officials. And I said, it makes for an almost um, bottom-up sourcing of poster content because there's of course um, still a selection process on part of the company um, and the transport officials are not without agency. Um, the second piece of evidence is that the visual format of posters demonstrates a kind of like corporate concern for customer sensibilities. Um, this means that the, the design of uh, Japanese transit etiquette posters often diverges from the authoritative and standardized format that is commonly employed by prescription and prohibition signage, as you see on the left here, like um, for example, on the top fi um, featuring the iconic slashed out red circle to prohibit smoking. Um, and instead of this kind of like standardized format, posters often adopt a more creative and playful format as you can see on the right here. And it's important to note in this context that You've, you've seen some more assertive posters than this before. So if you remember the ones that, um, you know, heavily featured like the gaze of like the, the discipline gaze of the passenger collective or like um, eyes looking at you. And um, these posters usually target more severe offenses. That's why they, they look a bit more assertive like that. Uh, in the terms of like this kind of like these kind of playful posters like you see on the right here. Um, this is the design that to the cynic and uh, to like a cynical observer might look like kind of like a subtle manipulatory attempt, but there are in fact um, practical reasons for this kind of design. So for example, the eye-catching design helps attract viewer attention as I already mentioned earlier, as it allows etiquette signage to compete with other semiotic stimuli in public transport spaces of which there are actually really a lot. Um, as you can see from these figures here, which show um, advertising spaces, designated advertising spaces and Japanese train stations and um, carriages. The second reason for, for the kind of like the visual format of posters 
is um, that the chosen visual design provides a solution to the tricky task of telling paying, pass, paying customers how they should or should not behave. Um, as it helps avoid, um, in other words, it helps avoiding customer offense. Um, public transport operators in Japan generally see their ability to intervene in passenger conduct as limited, um, as becomes evident from the, the quote on the slide here, um, which is from a railway company customer service officer who said that there are things we cannot forcefully demand. For example, while we ask passengers not to talk loudly on the train, in some situations people need to talk and so on. There are many things which we cannot completely prohibit, so the only stance we can take is we humbly ask for your cooperation. So this shows that public transport operators worry that confronting passengers, uh, confronting customers with clear-cut rules, such as through a crossed-out red circle, could be perceived as patronizing or as just simply not their place. And so because of that, they adopt, they opt for a design that invites customer audiences to instead independently consider the consequences of, of misbehavior such as by telling kind of like bite-sized um, stories of, of manner transgression. So this, this indicates that there's a, there's a fundamental concern about the perceived appropriateness of the visual content of posters, which is, for example, also evident from this um, next quote from one of my interviewees, this time from an art director at an uh, advertising company who said that, Ultimately, passengers who do not observe appropriate manners are also customers. So I took care that posters do not look like they're criticizing or ridiculing a specific passenger type. For this reason, the fictive setting of the posters was perfect as the characters that appear in them do not actually exist. We could use them as symbols of passengers with bad manners. Now, I think by, by now you probably have started to wonder about like the, the effectiveness of these kind of poster campaigns. Um, and that, that brings me to my third and final piece of evidence because you're really not alone with wondering how, how effective these, these kind of like mediated endeavors are in actually shaping passenger conduct. In fact, public transport operators that I spoke to voiced a lot of skepticism or, and doubts regarding posters' efficiency, which then raises again another question of like, why would they continue to invest money in these campaigns? I mean, especially since many of these um, campaigns are, are done by like large advertising companies and sometimes um, also like big name illustrators and so on. Um, the answer to this question, again, lies in the customer service function of, of posters. And I have one final quote here, which drives this point home. Um, this is again from a transport official who said that ultimately, our main goal is to show that we as a company are doing something to improve passenger etiquette. As I said earlier, we frequently get complaints. We need to show that we are honestly engaging with manner issues. So this shows that the purpose of posters is not to discipline passengers, but it's rather to prove that steps are being taken to deal with customer concerns. Remember here that, that much of the poster content comes from customer complaints and from customer satisfaction service and so on. It is because of transport companies adherence to customer service ideals that these kind of like customer grievances um, demand a kind of like corporate response and the, the transit etiquette campaigns are intended as just this response. In other words, then the primary objective of men poster campaigns is not to correct problematic passenger conduct, but rather to deal with its implications. Now, let, let's kind of consider these findings uh, in regards to um, poster initiatives potential correct character as the visual regime of urban mobility. And I first want to focus here on, on the visual aspects of it because that's a bit more straightforward to answer. Um, now, the, kind of like the, the example of the manner poster initiatives that I talked about um, really clearly demonstrates that endeavors to shape urban mobility practices often have a fundamentally visual character. 
visuality is a key component of the management of passenger offenses. Uh, and this really points to the need to examine visual aspects of governance strategies that are employed to manage mobilities. So in the context of public transport, next to posters, you could, for example, look at CCTV, which is increasingly common in public transport spaces and not just used to tackle crimes, but also mundane offenses. So think, for example, of train operators referring to live CCTV footage of the, the trains to, to discipline uh, misbehaving passengers via the un onboard announcement system. So for example, if they spot passengers blocking doors. Um, we could also even look at kind of like uh, this mundane regulatory practice of the ticket check, which is also fundamentally visual in character. Um, and importantly, we can look at the gaze of other passengers, which is uh, a key form of passenger policing of perceived misconduct by other public transport users and seems to be a factor that, um, that does shape people's behavior based on interviews that are conducted in Japan, even though often it is actually just like an imagined dis disciplinary act. So this points to rich potential of analyzing the visuality of interventions in problematic mobility practices or visual mobility regimes. Now, what about the notion of the, uh, of the mobility regime itself? Um, as we've seen before, this, this is a bit, it's really a bit more complicated to answer because as we've seen before, um, this, kind of, this kind of discussions of mobility regimes often focus on limiting aspects such as closure and containment. That said, there are also some more flexible interpretations of the term available. For example, um, Biao Xiang has written that by mobility regime, I mean a constellation of policies, cultural norms, and networks that condition, constrain, or facilitate migration. The concept also stresses the importance of policies and institutions that are not related to migration in themselves. Following this more open understanding, of the concept, it is in fact possible to frame transit etiquette poster campaigns as part of an urban mobility regime. Um, as it arguably, as, as these kind of posters arguably uh, do play a role in constructing um, cultural norms, such as like a code of commuter etiquette or commuter conduct. Even though um, this endeavor of actually like for formulating the code um, takes often like a backseat in the production of um, and of the production deployment of posters vis-a-vis -vis, um, other efforts like customer service goals. But following the, the definition of, of Xiang here, this is not a problem because a mobility regime can also um, include measures, institutions, policies that do not that are not explicitly about a certain mobility practice. That said, I still think that this term of regime is one that needs to be used with care. And the reason for that is that the, the because of the term's original meanings, it kind of has connotations which imply a premediated and sometimes even oppressive exercise of power. And this is something that likely explains the focus on closure and containment in, in previous discussions of mobility regimes. But it's also something that kind of not really appropriately, appropriately expresses the whole scope of endeavors that can be deployed to manage mobilities. And it is something that might be at odds with um, the uh, emic understandings of the measures that are in place, as we've seen when examining um, kind of the, the, the stories or the narratives um, my interviewees told me. I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so let me just briefly conclude here. Um, what I did during today's talk is I emphasized the need for um, the, 
I emphasize that the management of urban mobility practices such as passenger behaviors and public transport is something that deserves more attention as public transport is an arena in which even mundane behaviors can become problematic due to public transport's characteristics um, as a space of forced proximity and the frictions that may arise in these environments. Um, I've then talked about kind of like transgressions of codes of transit etiquette, which can have an adverse consequence. So for example, by lowering the appeal of public transport, causing operational disturbance and so on, which makes them the target of intervention by public transport operators. And I then looked at transit etiquette poster campaigns by Japanese urban railway providers as an example of one such intervention. Um, doing so, I demonstrated that interventions by uh, interventions in passenger conduct are not necessarily a straightforward control effort uh, and highlighted instead concerns with customer comfort and satisfaction as something that drives these initiatives. In other words, um, I, I've shown that efforts that affect mobility practices and potentials are not necessarily guided by, by an explicit will to regulate or govern people's movement. This diversity of the motivations that of potential interventions on passenger behavior is something that I would argue is a necessary point to consider when using a term such as regime, as the term might easily imply a pre-mediated and potentially oppressive use of power that might not be appropriate for the phenomena we study or that might uh, or the, the meanings our participants ascribe to them. That brings me to the end uh, of today's presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention and your time again. And I'm looking forward to, um, to questions, comments, and yeah, just discussing with you.